Good morning, every folks, and welcome to another installment of Know Your Unit. Uh, so today we're going to go for one of the most notorious ones. I can't wait to see how these are uh, rebalanced in the re remake, uh, but uh, the archer. All right, so what's the deal? Well, aside from uh, some friggin' spiffy hats, uh, their whole deal is uh, they are a shooter. They shoot. That is kind of the, the, the about the uh, the brunt of it right there. Uh, they don't really have a whole lot to them. Um, I've actually said for the longest time that it's a little bit weird that the uh, archer is the thing that ends up uh, getting all the praise and not their weapon. You see, um, the archer basically gets uh, semi-unique access to, uh, uh, to longbows, uh, but aside from that, there's not really a whole lot that's great about this class. They do get access to heavy crossbows, but dragoons and rogues can do that better. Um, when it comes to the archer, uh, basically uh, their, uh, their entire thing Thing is taking full advantage of the first and second part of the equation. See, their uh, dex is unusually high uh, compared to the other classes, so they're basically relying on dexterity and the dexterity scaling off the longbow to overpower the other guy. If they're able to successfully do so, um, which happens pretty often, again, they can stack decks uh, pretty darn high. Uh, both them and the Fusilier actually are very good at stacking dexterity. So if they get to phase two and they're able to scale up all of their damage in in many cases, they can just simply walk their way right past step three, which is the armor check. But here's the thing. Um, if you run into any unit with, like, let's say an attenuate skill that happens to match their bow, uh, they're going to be doing a one. <laughs> if they happen to have somebody with exceptionally high armor or if they run into somebody carrying a, uh, a bow skill, they're once again going to be doing very little damage. So it's, it's a very interesting situation with this class. And Again, why I'm so curious as to as to how the remake is going to handle them, because they're basically exploiting the armor mechanics in a really weird way <laughs> in order to do the kinds of uh, sort of meta stuff that they do. They are, in many ways, to many folks, you know, the meta for uh, uh, for this game. And, and until they find all the other potential metas that are available. Now, why do I say the class itself sucks? Well, they don't really have a whole lot of uh, things that can overcome their weaknesses. See. They do that shooty part real well, but uh, Deflect exists in the late game, which basically means that there is a pretty solid chance, a up to 40% chance, that their shot will do next to nothing. Uh, their main counter to this is double shots. They just shoot twice, and I have seen double deflects roll pretty regularly in the end game. Um, now, yes, Deflect has a low percentage uh, chance of uh, landing, but at the same time, this is a class that uh, has essentially one mode, uh, and that is shoot. Um, the only other counter that they have is their uh, is going to be their finishers, which if they're relying on their finishers, then they're not really going to be uh, doing a whole lot uh, with uh, you know with uh, some of their other abilities. Double shot does have the potential to uh, recharge itself by the next round. Uh, a tremendous shot has the chance to recharge itself by the next round, but that's the deceptive part right there because if a deflect hits and it eats either one of those, suddenly they're just t uh, taking regular shots for the next couple rounds. So either way, very interesting situation with this class, but their movement is three. That is the same as all the spellcasters in the game. Uh, they're not terribly fast uh, for comparison. Uh, if we compare them with, like, let's say a monster unit, uh, they have a 20% uh, percent, uh, higher RT uh, compared to their own. Um, they are about the equivalent of a standard spellcaster in most cases. Um, so, yeah, they are a physical version of a spellcaster. That's, that's really the best way to put it. Uh, their uh, debuff access is pretty all right off their weapons. Uh, longbows ac uh, get access to uh, shackle as well as uh, uh, as well as charm. Uh, Flaming glass is really going to be their uh, their best finisher for most of the game. Uh, they get access to leaden early on, uh, which is uh, basically at 100 TP when it comes to longbows. Uh, leaden, uh, your weighted shot is going to be your best uh, damage dealer uh, for 100. But if fully scaled up, flaming blast is going to be the best. Uh, the other two are kind of situational for when you need shutdown moves on a particular thing, but you don't want them charmed for one reason or another, like you think they're they're going to overcome that charm, uh, or if the unit's mind is low. So that's actually another thing. Um, a lot of the uh, odds of them actually landing their, uh, their debuffs on their special abilities are going to be tied to their, uh, I believe it's actually their base mind score. Uh, because it always seems to be at 100% if you're at 100 mind, but it always seems about 30-40% uh, early on. So, it might just be your mind total versus the other person's defense, but I've always kind of felt that it must be a fixed rate tied to base mind score. 
either way, uh, early on, they're not as likely to uh, uh, to hit that uh, that particular thing. But if you ever want them to be more likely to actually uh, land that thing, you could always put a ring of the mind on them. Now, what kind of interesting builds can you do? Well, you got the classic. Uh, they have a unique set effect, semi-unique semi uh, set effect. I believe it's uh, uh, the uh, the ranger and the lord that can also equip this same thing. Um, but actually, no, wait, I, I believe lord doesn't actually get access to this because it's dark, ain't it? Um... Yeah, that would not be... Yeah, that does not look like it's got Lord on there. Okay, never mind. Okay, so it's Archer and it looks like Ranger that can uh, that can get all jiggly with it. Um, this thing basically takes your range damage um, and it replaces your, uh, your longbow with a rocket launcher. Um, Basically, it seems to be entirely uh, dark scaling uh, damage, and it also, most of that damage does seem to be coming from the scaling side of things, because as I've mentioned before, uh, even something like a, a attenuate dark, if you find any uh, units that are carrying it, uh, will effectively mitigate this thing back down to just being a normal physical weapon. Um, so very, uh, very odd case there, but... You know, it is what it is. Um, anyway, so what else can they potentially do? And oh, oh, by the way, I should also probably mention a uh, stalker earring definitely over the uh, there's a lot of elemental longbows that they get. Um, definitely take the stalker over the other ones. Uh, the uh, the uh, bow suffers uh, when it comes to the third uh, uh, phase of their calculation, uh, which is that uh, armor penetration. Um, and in that particular case, uh, you're going to be getting far more out of the effectively plus eight penetration off this uh, stalker earring. Well, it's actually like plus 17 uh, that you get off this earring because you get the plus 9 off the thing itself um, and then the plus 8 off the uh, bow plus 2 there. Um, but basically, if you're going for all uh, uh, all elemental damage uh, and just going straight for that scaling thing, technically your maximum could be higher, uh, but it's going to be completely eaten up by resistances. So it, it basically is just a far riskier play. Stalker earring just definitely takes the cake on that one. All right, so another interesting thing is, as, as I mentioned earlier, they can stack decks like almost no other. Um, so you can do interesting stuff like this, where, for example, um, and by the way, for the purposes of this example, I took a base unit out of the store and just turned them into a cursed weapon. Um, I use this as kind of the like low bar for cursed weapons. Technically, these can pretty much render any unit completely broken if you put a maxed out uh, unit on there. But for the purpose of showing off utility, we're just doing this off some rando generic. Um, so this is the lowest that this thing can get. Uh, attack scores in the 40s, you know, stats getting boosted in about the 15s. Your primary weapon boosts your stats. Your secondary weapon, however, uh, can essentially be used uh, used in the offhand there. So you can functionally use this for a lot of extra armor, to as well as extra dexterity, to also overcome something like this, uh, wherein you're slightly sacrificing armor, despite the fact that these actually have like, really good armor stats on them, um, to effectively give yourself, like, just insano amounts of dexterity. This guy's dex is at 81 right now, by the way. That can actually, uh, if we decided to, I don't know, go for something like a, like a ring of, uh, deafness, can go up to 291. If you put the fire crest on this bad boy, uh, it, uh, it goes, again, up to 291, as well as, uh, getting additional attack and defense and everything else. Um, but, uh, but yeah. The reason that you'd go for something like this is the uh, the mass crossbow plus one. I've gone over this thing endlessly, but it automatically gives itself more penetration. It has a stun effect on uh, on hit again, presumably tied to mind score there because it seems to hit pretty darn often. Um, the extra dexterity off all of these items, uh, the uh, the snipe set by the way, uh, gives you insane insane amount of dex at the cost of vitality. That's why you'd want to have some way to counteract that. Um, but basically, this will cause this crossbow to hit like an absolute truck. Again, you're getting plus four uh, crossbow rank off this gear, uh, so it's doing just fine. Uh, effectively, this crossbow that was previously uh, kind of iffy became equivalent to a almost endgame elemental longbow in terms of its uh, raw damage, or in terms of its uh, raw penetration there. I apologize for the number of weird mechanics flying around with this thing. There's just a lot of mechanics to this system. <laughs> Anyway, point being, this thing hit good. It go past armor real nice. And uh, because of the fact that it's getting all this extra scaling, it's getting an additional benefit to its armor penetration um, because it's basically going to be penetrating about like mid to low heavy tier armor. But with all of this additional dex, it's starting off that initial calculation with far more of an advantage. So it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be pushing through real nice. 
doesn't have the greatest range in the world, but still. Um, additionally, uh, you can combine this uh, with uh, something like Sidestep, because they can function as a skirmisher in this case. Uh, deflect, because they are carrying a melee weapon, which allows them to, again, uh, do that uh, skirmisher roll. Swift for, for getting in close, strengthen for taking advantage of all that extra dex. Uh, tremendous shot to guarantee a stun effect whenever you need it. Draconology, though, uh, because uh, throughout all of this, you know, it probably would be pretty beneficial to uh, have this uh, light crossbow uh, maybe take out some dragons too. Why not? Uh, augment fire because uh, we're going for uh, presumably somebody that's going to do really darn well with their uh, grenade launcher. And uh, yeah, uh, I feel like it's a pretty solid and fun build. Jump one because of course they're using a light crossbow. They've got lower range. You want to give them some better angles to shoot from. All right, next up, uh, we have our next one that is going to be the, uh, the light skirmisher variant. You know I love my skirmisher units, I love my counter archer units, and uh, and yeah, similar to the uh, Damask Crossbow, the uh, Damask Bow, stun effect, not as good of a uh, additional penetration effect off the uh, the bow uh, plus there, but essentially uh, they're, uh, they're just getting nice bonuses across the board here. This is going for more of a luck type setup. Uh, essentially uh, stacking uh, 30 luck off the alluring set um, as well as uh, another additional 10 off the azure necklace uh, you know presumably you move denim off to somebody else at that point so they're combining all this stuff together can oftentimes really uh, circumvent a lot of their uh, armor uh, discrepancies or uh, lack thereof uh, along with uh, like for example something like sidestep they're just gonna be doing a far better job dodging stuff with that really high luck uh, Constitution, just as a backup plan, though they have a shield to kind of shore up their defense in this situation. A uh, strengthen for their uh, flaming blasts there. Uh, Aug light for reasons that I completely should not have put on there because it should be doing Aug fire uh, because they're essentially going for flaming fireballs. This is essentially a witch that never, they kind of skip magic school and just trained with a bow instead. That's what's going on here. Uh, double shot for double the chance of inflicting stun. Uh, technically, you can do a, a tremendous shot as well. I just kind of imagine them more as a trick shooter, so that's just on there for fun. Uh, swift food, uh, swift food. Hmm. Okay. Apparently, they also entered a hot dog eating contest. Uh, contest, but anyway, a uh, swift foot, um, uh, because uh, you know, naturally, skirmisher, shorter range, once again, better position, overpower uh, to uh, synergize with double shots to hopefully get those through easier. Uh, not to mention, uh, in the end game, you start seeing stuff like evade more often. So this uh, double shot is just a great thing for uh, getting past evade. Um, all right, so next we have the uh, the early game version. Uh, this is the same thing that uh, the uh, the uh, rogue is capable of, uh, however, with less movement. So basically, same deal there. But later on, you can combine in double shot, and then it has double the chance to stun. So that's nice. Um, then we have the uh, another uh, luck type situation. However, this one's going for band of fortune for that uh, twenty luck, uh, combined with uh, stacking decks off the uh, the uh, non unique weapons because you know I wanted to show off what you could do with that as well. So Brigandine plus one and Nomad Bracers are, again, very, like, the Brigandine, obviously, everyone can pretty much use, um, but the Nomad Bracers are, again, Fusilier, uh, Ranger, and Archer only, um, and they are going to give you the best dex bonus outside of the Snipe set. Um, they're, uh, unfortunately, a bit annoying to actually craft, but... Hopefully you can find yourself a feather pretty easily. Um, the Espis, uh, because one of the things that would be countering them would be uh, something like Balmy Breeze, which makes them, uh, th basically this will make that not hit. Um, and then Urchin Bola uh, gives a leaden effect, plus it also imp increases your penetration on top of what it already has. So this thing enters the contest with a base 156 uh, penetration value um, on top of what, it, like, you can get it to almost 200 with the, uh, the actual skill maxed out. So... It's kind of nuts uh, uh, how good this can potentially work. Now, the reason that you're doing this, uh, you're stacking your stats in order to boost up your uh, your weapon here, um, because when it gets a crit, then you can essentially double up on that damage. It's pretty nice. Anyway, um, and then next, uh, we have another one that's, again, just kind of for fun. This is another witch, uh, kind of a, a witch that skipped a magic school kind of situation. Uh, going for the alluring set to make sure they're charm proof and slow proof in this case um and then uh, going for azure for stun proof so they've got some nice little uh, uh you know debuff resistances but the capito bow uh, which uh, has low attack score but it does have a uh, a charm on hit effect combine that with tremendous shot combine that with tactician 2 they can eff effectively just make friends every round and that is wonderful so uh capito is probably one of my favorite bows on them just because there's nothing overpowered about it it just feels good to uh to kind of mass cheese stun at long range. I believe this is actually the longest range stun option to, or uh, uh, charm option, uh, rather. So it's just fun to mess around with. But either way, uh, they're, again, they're a class that is very, um, 
uh, you can do some stuff with them, but their overall access to everything but the longbow is either nothing to write home about or a little bit dicey. Uh, like, for example, uh, like weapon-wise, uh, they can equip daggers, but they can only equip some of the daggers. So, like, they can do curse daggers. You can kind of go for a, a counter-stun kind of build if you're... Uh, like, if you're going Skirmisher and you're going for close range on a class that has basically no movement and no defense, um, you can go for a counter-stun type of situation. Uh, Damask Dagger does that pretty darn well. Uh, Balder Dagger... I mean, yeah, there's not really a whole lot of reason you'd use, use this except for anti-undead. So if you're going through Palace of the Dead, you want to have a close range archer. That would be your kind of uh, option there. Uh, sticker is just your early game type of deal. Um, they don't get access to fans. Uh, they don't uh, really get much else, but they do get uh, a pretty good complement of most of the range weapons. Uh, they, In theory, they would make uh, blowguns absolutely broken, but, uh, you know, they uh, don't get access to those. Um but they do get all the longbows, uh, so you got uh, pretty much every element available to them, uh, longbow-wise. Though, I will say it's a little overstated how, you know, quote-unquote easy it is to get access to some of these. Um, because in order to get access to, uh, to some of them, you need to go through one of the elemental temples. But if you want the best one, you have to completely uh, clear out Farampa, and you have to do the volcano map at the very end. Um, and... Well, obviously this is going to be changing and reborn, but this also comes with a little bit of a caveat that you have to risk your original version. Now, obviously not everyone's going to be playing on Iron Man rules and all that, and something like Excamilles is uh, is kind of busted when you're combining it with Tremendous Shot, but it, I mean, for how much effort you have to go through to get some of these upgraded bows, yeah, they better be pretty dang good. Though, as a little bit of a side note, um, also some interesting stuff happens with their layout. So, like, for example, you start off with the Permafrost and the Tempest that you can get pretty uh, pretty easily. Though, for some reason, the Crescent is less likely to drop than those ones, though, I mean, it, it comes up often enough. Um, but, uh, with all of that, uh, you essentially are, are barred out of many of the upgrades there uh, through uh, needing that uh, that bow in Sheridigan. But uh, then you get to stuff like, for example, the Earth and the Fire Bow not having two stacked elements together. So, like, for example, Thunder gets two longbows, Wind gets two longbows, um, and Ice gets two longbows. But everybody else is kind of, like, just, just kind of there. <laughs> so, just kind of odd there, but anyway. Um, I, other little details to mention in this one. Uh, Jiggly is... Uh, this used to have a penetration effect uh, back on uh, the SNES version. It does not here. Um... I mean, it, it basically just kills instead, but whatever. Um, and what else? So early uh, early bow-wise, by the way, a few little uh, fun things here. Uh, the longbow actually does end up uh, kind of kind of staying as a relevant weapon throughout most of the game. In fact, this can actually last you till chapter four, uh, just because of that extra tile of range and it's actually it, like its overall penetration doesn't really go up that much. Um, like the siege bow is only up to eighty-seven, while uh, the, uh, the longbow is sixty-one. Um, the short bow that you start with, though, is 28. So, like, the jump to the longbow is more than double uh, your initial starting weapon, but then the jump to a full-on, uh, like, end of, uh, the end of the game weapon is only, like, 25%-ish, uh, give or take. I mean, well, well 25 points-ish. Point being, um, point being that, yeah, this thing can last you quite a long while. Uh, Balder Bow ends up being pretty worthwhile in Palace of the Dead, uh, just due to anti-undead stuff. Um, Composite Bow is kind of meh, but it's pretty easy to upgrade. Uh, Siege Bow, however, does give you Bind and Bows plus two. So in many cases, that's actually worth considering over some of the higher tier bows. Uh, Damask plus one, despite being a upgrade to the basic Damasco uh, bow, is the best one-handed variant, um, and also uh, also just uh, is a, a little bit difficult to actually uh, get a, a hold of the upgraded version for. Um, what else? Uh, Crossbow-wise, basically same stuff that we covered for the uh, the rogue there. Um, you got stuff like knockback on the steel bow. You got uh, a knockback on the heavy crossbow. The uh, stone bow as well, uh, but the bow gun plus one gives you a stone effect. Balder does the Balder thing. Uh, Damask does the Damask thing. Um, but as far as uh, available early game uh, power options for this, uh, Rude Bow synergizes really well with your uh, flashbang shot there. Um, and yes, I realize that's not its actual name, but you know what I mean, the rank eight. Um, you get a bind effect on the Daedalus Bow Gun, though realistically that thing is... Uh, this thing is really kind of kind of weak for how much you have to go... You have to beat uh, Nibeth on floor 100 of Palace of the Dead to get this dang thing. And it's coming in with, like, I mean, 
you could easily have gotten all of these other crossbows with way more power and better effects to them by the time that you end up <laughs> getting... Okay, whatever. I'm, I'm just picking on uh, Daedalus stuff again. Um, anyway, uh, point being, it breaks legs. It is a leg breaker crossbow. Um, what else we got here? I mean, most of these are just going to be raw damage options of different sorts. Uh, they don't get access to fusils, and then, you know, thrown weapons are fine as they are. Um, actually, throwing weapon plus lobber allows you to make them into a kind of support type deal as well, so potentially something to consider, though realistically they're so slow that uh, they're really not too great as a support, especially if you happen to make use of any of their uh, RT, or not RT, but any of their TP moves. Um, they do actually wind up pretty darn slow with their uh, with their different shots. It's why I usually recommend rogues over, uh, over archers, and well, pretty much any situation. But either way, to each their own, sometimes you just need a friggin' snazzy hat. Um, but yeah, when it comes to uh, raw scaling damage, they are definitely one of the better ones because of their unique kind of... Uh, I wouldn't say it's super unique. It's interesting because each of the ranged units has different approaches to uh, how to break the ranged formula. It's like in their case, they simply only stack decks, right? Their strength sucks, which is why they end up taking physical hits real hard. Um, but yeah, they primarily stack decks, which basically just allows them to try to overflow their damage from phase one, multiply it by phase two, and then just hopefully overwhelm armor entirely in phase three, which is why they cannot deal with shields until they get past uh, like rank six or so in their longbows. Um, because a shield and worm scale uh, combo in the endgame completely mitigates their damage so they end up doing like 10 where they were previously doing like 150 um so again just fascinating scenario on that because uh over on the uh, on the rogues end they end up splitting their uh, their offensive stats to a higher uh, higher total between strength and dexterity and increase their uh, class uh, attack penetration by only two but it's enough to make them far better at circumventing armor in that third phase but then you get over to uh to pretty much any other class, and they're usually better at stacking things like anatomy or bow skills. Uh, or, for example, uh, you get something like the Fusilier, which just decides, screw it, we're going all in for phase three, we're doing the total opposite. So their penetration is rejonculous, but they have no scaling. So they're basically relying off their... Uh, they can potentially win the uh, the first contest uh, through stuff like that, uh, uh, like that uh, snipe set. Um, and it basically allows them to completely uh, dominate over, uh, like, in pretty much every category. If you put archers and fusiliers one-to-one, -one, fusiliers will win the vast majority of the time because they're just simply more consistent. Uh, they overwhelm armor um, and, uh, and just kind of go from there, even if they can't really scale their damage as high. So, anyway, it's really fun how they how they uh, get around armor and they do all their different things and their gear options and defensive options are absolute trash tier. Their movement is terrible. Um, again, their standard movement is three, so swift foot almost becomes mandatory in the end game for them. If somebody gets close to a longbow unit um, and they can, they, like almost any melee unit, if they can touch a longbow unit, they can counter that longbow unit with no trouble whatsoever. The Like if they cannot kill something before it reaches them, they're done <laughs> because they cannot outrun their dead zone, <laughs> uh, which is why those uh, skirmisher type builds uh, tend to be uh, uh, tend to be quite a bit more adaptable. Uh, that's just something to consider. But anyway, you should be supporting those units anyway. So you guys have a good one. Take care. I hope this was at least uh, fun and enlightening to some degree and have yourselves a good one. Take care.